we are the Institute for Corporate Productivity. Uh, we do research in all areas of human capital and human research. We discover the people practices that truly drive high performance. What we mean by high performance are organizations that thrive in terms of revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction. So when we do our quantitative studies, we're looking at, at organizations trying to tease out what practices uh, say the top quartile are doing better than the lower quartile according to those metrics, uh, and then share those with all of our member companies, of which there are many. We are a member-based organization. You see here just a small sampling of the outstanding logos of some of our members. You see we uh, our members represent really all industries uh, across uh, banking, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, you name it. Um, some smaller companies, but certainly lots of the the biggest companies in the world as well, like Amazon, Accenture, Microsoft, 3M, and, and so on. So if you're with one of our member companies and on the call today, welcome, special welcome to you. We love as many members joining these Thursday calls as possible. Again, my name is Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst here at I4CP. Uh, I am currently coming to you from Las Vegas. I'm at the Mirage. My wife is presenting at a conference here, and so I hope that my internet will be strong enough to host this call today. I think so far, so good. Uh, and I'm joined as always by Kevin Oaks, our CEO and co-founder. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Tom. And yeah, we're, we're both in uh, different locations. I'm in Western Massachusetts today calling from here, but uh, good to see you. Yeah, I like the background. You got some nice windows behind you there. Yeah. Looks, looks, looks like a nice room. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we've got a couple of great guests that we'll be introducing here in just a, a few moments. Um, but as always, I want to note uh, the upcoming calls we have. Um, we actually have these calls every Thursday. I mentioned every other. We focus on hybrid and flexible work, the new world of work every other Thursday, like today. Uh, on alternating Thursdays, we focus on different practice areas of HR. So one week it might be HR strategy, another week it'll be DEI. You see, coming up on November 3rd, we're going to have our next talent and learning call. And we're going to be focused there on the sort of hot topic of talent mobility and you know, internal talent marketplaces. Then on the 10th, we'll have Jessica Noble from Hallmark, uh, once again on hybrid and flexible work. You see the other guests we have coming up on the 17th and then uh, December 1st. Uh, make note, we will be skipping Thanksgiving week here in the United States. Um, so for those of you in the US, that won't come as a surprise. For others, just a reminder that the, that's a, a holiday week here and so we won't have a meeting on November 24th. Also want to note our big conference. Uh, once a year, we gather HR leaders, uh, four to 500 of them in Scottsdale, Arizona. This year, it'll be somewhat later in March. Uh, it's always in the month of March. Um, of course, during the pandemic, we had to shift to uh, a virtual event for a couple of years. This past year, it was great uh, to once, one get, once again gather in person, uh, although we did do it hybrid, so there will be a virtual element. Um, folks have been already registering, signing up for that event. Um, for the past several months now, we're seeing really strong interest uh, signups, including a lot of group signups. Uh, a lot of HR leaders are, are bringing, you know, their entire say, senior team uh, to this event. You see here some of the great speakers we have lined up, thought leaders, book authors, uh, fellow CHROs and other high level HR leaders. So we're looking forward to that late March. Uh, you see the link there and Zeta will put it in the chat if she hasn't already. Um, and there is a discount uh, through uh, December 9th uh, to register, uh, sort of early bird registration code. So excited about that coming up. All right, at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to you, Kevin, to introduce today's guest. Oh, thanks, Tom. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we've got two fantastic guests with us today in Mary Beth Forte and, and Lauren Mutes um, from Daiichi Sankyo. So Mary Beth and Lauren, welcome. Thank you, it's good to be here. It's great. It's great to have you. I, um, you know, I, I, I know that uh, some people on the line probably know your organization, but probably more uh, do not. So I thought it'd be great just for you to introduce yourselves, what you do at the company, but also a little bit about the company itself so we can ground everybody in, in the industry and uh, some of the things that you're doing. Sure, sounds good. So I'll int I'll start by introducing the company, then I'll introduce myself and hand it over to Lauren to so that she can introduce herself as well. Um, and you're right, most people in the U.S. aren't aren't overly familiar with Daiichi Sankyo. We are a company, pharmaceutical company that's headquartered in Japan. Um, we've been around for over 100 years. Between the between Daiichi and Sankyo, they merged um, in the past probably 20 years or so. But overall, as a company, been around for 100 years. 
We offer innovative um, pharmaceuticals and services in more than 20 countries around the world. We have 16,000 colleagues globally, 1,500 of which are here in the U.S. Lauren and I are primarily responsible for those colleagues in the U.S. However, we are on a journey of becoming increasingly global, and that's connected to the fact that our pipeline has really encouraged us to transform into an oncology company. And what we found is that to be successful in the oncology space, we really need to have a strong global footprint in order to get the medicine to patients. Um, so that's really what drives ourselves and all of our colleagues, a focus on being innovative, bringing medicine to patients, really making a difference um, in society in a sustainable way. Um, when you think about our company, most people will say, well, do you have any products I've ever heard of. Um, so what we are, well, we, while we are proud of all of our products, the one that you may have seen recently in the news um, is known as Inhertu. It's a breast cancer medication. Currently, clinical trials are ongoing for other indications as well. Um, but we are extraordinarily proud of that product. It is one we developed in house. Um, it uses our in house developed ADC or anti drug conjugate technology um, to really target the cancer. So it's really a new way of treating cancer. We're excited about that. Um, and the one thing, and we tend to be a pretty humble culture, but one thing I will brag about on our behalf is that at a recent meeting of ASCO, which is an um, oncology organization. It's a, the biggest oncology meeting was held here in the States. We received a pretty unprecedented, like minute long standing ovation for clinical trial results for that product. So that was one of the most, like it at, to be on the journey of our organization to kind of have seen that moment to come to fruition. We were really proud of that because of what it means to our patients. Um, so that's a little bit about our company, about me personally. I have over 20 years of experience in the HR space. I've been at Daiichi Sankyo for 10 of those years, so really enjoyed the journey because even though it's been 10 years, it's been a different company throughout, although our culture, I would say, has stayed the same, which is why I stay as well. Um, I've had the chance to have a variety of different roles in the HR space. I grew up in the compensation space, a little bit of OD and performance, some time as a business partner and in HR operations. And now we're in the space of total well-being, um, which is really a passion for me. Um, a lot of companies kind of refer to it as a total reward space. Several years ago, we really wanted to take a more holistic look um, and kind of rebranded ourselves as a total well-being team, which I, I will talk a little bit more about in the future. But on a personal note, um, I've been married for 20 years. So it's a big year. I had two big anniversaries this year in terms of personal and work. Um, I've got two great kids. One is a senior in high school. So we're going through all that fun college stuff right now. The other is an eighth grader in middle school eager to get to high school. Um, and in terms of they really, I always joke like they kind of are my hobby at, at this point in time. But we did get a chance to cross off um, one of our family bucket list items with a recent trip to Lambeau Field. So that was exciting. <laughs> and it was when the Packers were still winning. So it's fun. <laughs> I've, I've always wanted to go to Lambeau Field. I've, I've yet to make it there, but uh, you gotta uh, go. So, it was amazing. <laughs> it sounds like you got a lot of really uh, cool things going on in your life, but I do want to just call out the the breast cancer uh, uh, solution that you mentioned. That's something to be very proud of, Mary Beth, and, uh, and something you're, I'm sure everybody in the company is very proud of. Yes, well, yes, very, Lauren, very, very much so. Great. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Lauren Mutes. I am Director of Employee Experience and Engagement at Daiichi Sankyo, working on with Mary Beth and her team. I've been with Daiichi Sankyo only for two years, but I have about 15 years of experience in really the um, employee engagement space. That's my passion. It's all about how do we listen to employees and really create an environment where they're ultimately bringing their best in support of uh, the work that they're doing, right? So uh, prior to Daiichi Sankyo, I worked for about 11 years in a completely different industry. I came from the, the home healthcare uh, space. I worked at a company called Bayada for 11 years, uh, similar work, really creating the engagement strategy. And what I'm proud of working on here is what we're going to certainly be talking about today with We Thrive. 
uh, along with some work that we're doing around listening to our employees really at a global level. So that wasn't something we had ever done before at, at Zaiichi. So we started it at DSI, which is in our among our US colleagues. And now we're really listening at this global level because we have 9,000 employees that are in Japan. And then we have about five or 6,000 in other markets. So being able to have that comprehensive story has been, has been wonderful. Um, when I'm not at work and doing what I love at work, I, um, I have two, uh, I have two dogs. I have a cat and a partner that I live with, and I am passionate about animals. I also really like to give back to the community. So I volunteer for a few organizations. One of those organizations is actually helping uh, employees that are struggling at work. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to kind of support and coach people that aren't having a good work experience. So it can give me that opportunity to support them in that way. Um, and then my other real passion is I play the drums. So I've been playing since I was about eight years old. Um, I started out really playing on some, I don't know if you all remember like Folgers, those Folger um, kit tins and things. So eventually my parents said, oh gosh, all right, we'll buy you a drum set. They didn't really love it. Uh, it was loud, but it's been a passion of mine ever since. So. I enjoy that. And I'm a Giants fan. So Mary Beth and I get along okay because the Pat, you know, it's not like she's a Cowboys fan or an Eagles fan. Then I don't know, but um, I'm, a, I'm a, from New York originally. And I'm a proud Giants and Mets fan. So that's a little bit about me. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Lauren. I, I love the drum story. It's uh, um, good to get all that background. And, you know, I, I noted um, that Japan just opened up uh, fully uh, the other day, um, and which I was excited to see. I, I, I love going to Japan uh, anytime I can. And I'm, I'm assuming that both of you get over there once in a while. Is that, is that a good assumption? So I have been there um, once a couple of years ago. We are looking forward to going back because of the increase in global work that we've had. So with them reopening, we are definitely getting ready to plan some trips over there so we can work with our colleagues there face to face. Fantastic. Well, one of the things uh, we're definitely going to talk about is a listening strategy. But before we get there, um, I wanted to just note on uh, culture overall, we've, uh, we've been big fans of how important a listening strategy is to changing culture and really understanding culture. And I, I say this to senior executive teams all the time, probably the worst thing that they could do is lock themselves in a conference room and decide amongst themselves what the culture is today, because <laughs> they're uh, bound to get it wrong if they do that. Um, and listening strategy is just so important uh, to understanding culture. So before we get into the listening strategy, I just really love to understand a little bit about your culture. Um, did it change much during the pandemic? And from a you know, global company perspective, I'd love to hear how uh, you, you wrestle with some of the differences between you know, US and Japan from a culture perspective. Yeah, so I, I think from a, from a fundamental culture perspective, we have kind of stayed the same, right? I, I think our, our, and I'll talk about that in a second, our biggest changes are more in how we addressed hybrid working and flexibility. So from a culture perspective, we are one very much focused on collaboration, working with each other, a sense of team is incredibly strong for us. Um, we, we really are an organization where it's more about what we accomplish together than, than what any one of us accomplishes as an individual. And you'll see people who are more about the me not really succeed here. Um, so as someone who is all about team, I kind of grew up that way. Um, it's a good fit for me. It's a great fit for Lauren. We work really well together in that way. Um, it's also an organization we're driven by our shared passion, right? Oftentimes, as we meet new colleagues, we'll share with each other our, our story and what really drives us to, to be focused on um, patients who have cancer. I personally lost my mom to breast cancer, right? So all of us have this innate drive to help be a part of a solution. Um, and that really, I think, is what pushes us forward in that team-sensed way. Um, it, we do have cultural differences, right, a, a, across the board. But one example I love to share is that there's this 
ability to really absorb each other's culture. So a, a quick story on that is in, in Japanese culture, it's very common to bow your head of, as a sign of respect. When you meet someone, when you say goodbye in the US, we shake hands. So oftentimes when you have a US colleague and a Japanese colleague greeting each other, the Japanese colleague will go to shake hands and the US colleague will go to bow, right? So there, there's this desire to be really respectful of each other's cultures, um, yeah. which is fun. And we have, we have a good time with it. Um, we, we have learned for, on a U.S. perspective, you know, there are differences, right? We tend to be more direct than our Japanese colleagues. So navigating through all of that and having a lot of, you know, pre-meeting conversations to get people on board. Um, so all things you have to adapt to if you're used to working in a very direct, fast-paced organization. We are fast-paced, but we have a lot of couple extra steps as part of that fast pace. Um, when I think about how did we change as a result of the pandemic? I think really our approach to flexibility is the key way we change there. So prior to the pandemic, we had what I would call a very rigid old school approach to flexible working. It was, you know, one to two, one to two days a week at the most. Any more than that had to basically have like, you know, everyone's signature on it. There was a formal contract. It got reviewed each year. You were basically like swearing up and down. I don't know that you weren't doing other things. It felt very big brotherish. I was not a fan of it. So to be transparent on that. Um, what we found, ironically, in the months leading up to the pandemic, because of our success, we were running out of space in our building. So we were working on a, what we called a space evolution project, where we were reconfiguring what our floor plans would look like, moving to what would kind of classically be termed hoteling. Um, we, we've tried not to use that terminology. It's more unassigned workstations. Um, really with a focus on increasing flexible working so that when you were coming into the building, it was very intentional, right? You were coming in either to collaborate with colleagues on work or to connect with them either on work or socially just to kind of tie those and have those bond bonds with each other. Um, so in essence, the pandemic became our pilot right? So I'll always want to make lemonade out of lemons. We used it as a, as a pilot, which I think probably like many other organizations, it proved at a much more rapid rate than would have naturally evolved the ability of organizations to work in a 100% remote way, right? We didn't miss a beat. We were successful. We were continuing to get um, products through the review process and get approvals um, while we were out. So we use the opportunity to say, we can be successful in this way. So let's really think about what work looks like when we go back to the office. Um, and Lauren, I don't wanna to take too much of what you're gonna say, so cut me off if I do. Um, we called our return, really Flex and Connect was kind of our, our corporate branding on it. And it was really all about increasing flexibility, focusing on connecting with each other. We did away with all that formality, moved to an approach of on average, you're in the office one to four days a week, and that averages over a month, right? So if you're a finance team and you're like really busy at the end of the month and you need to be in, well, there's your four days and the rest of the month, maybe you're all remote working. Um, so really based on the needs of the team, we found also an interesting shift before the pandemic, when people were, were remote working, it would be, okay, well, you're remote working today, so I'm going to be in the office so that we have coverage. We've completely turned that on its head. And now it's, we're either kind of as a team, we're all remote or we're all in person, because if we're in person, we're there to be together. Yeah. Um, so I think really for us, fundamentally, the key reason people are going in is to have connection with each other. Because what we discovered is that while we can definitely be successful remotely, there is something irreplaceable about being physically present with each other and just having those conversations, forming those bonds so that when there is a difficult conversation to be had, there's a relationship basis on which you're doing that. And for us, maybe that's different than other companies. We've grown very rapidly during the pandemic. So we have a lot of remote hires and that's where I found, even in HR, right, we almost doubled in size during the pandemic. Having those in-person, face-to-face, just bond-creating conversations really are what will kind of um, ignite us to being successful. 
So you almost doubled in size during the pandemic. That's uh, as an HR team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. That's great. Um, well, I, I know um, we want to do a quick poll here on listening, but before we do, um, we uh, uh, Tom's had this uh, slide up for a little while. We recently just came out with a new white paper called Supercharger Listening Strategy, and it's based on uh, research that our analysts have uh, created and case studies that they've conducted uh, over the last couple of years, just on some of the, the next practices that organizations are using uh, with their listening strategies internally. I've been actually excited about some of the technology that's being used with listening strategies, you know, the combination of natural language processing with AI uh, so that companies can allow people to respond in their own words versus only answering, uh, you know, uh, survey questions. But there's a lot of different ways people are utilizing listening strategies today. So if you're an I4CP member, uh, go check out that, um, uh, that white paper. I think you'll find it quite interesting. But uh, Zeta, maybe this is a good time to do our, a quick little poll on listening strategy that we had uh, put up. Yeah, very good. So we actually have two questions here. One is, um, as part of your listening strategy, how often are you seeking employee input? And uh, you've got a few choices there. You may do it on a different uh, cadence than what we have as choices, and that's okay. And then the, um, the second question is when surveying employees, how are you doing it? You know, are you asking liquor questions? Are you getting writing comments? Uh, are you using some of that technology that I talked about? So I'd love to see some of the uh, responses to this. And, and the responses are, are coming in here, Kevin, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I can't see them, Tom. So I'll, I'll rely on you to... Uh, yeah. Uh, talk to those responses, but uh, Lauren and Mary Beth, as you look at these questions, how would you answer them? Yeah, I would say, so we're, we're definitely early in our journey, right, from a, a listening approach, and we have a goal to get to that sort of always on, which we're doing a bit in ways now, and I can talk more about, you know, about some of the ways we're doing that, but right now we do a, a couple of key surveys throughout the year, but then what we've also really been doing is building upon that listening with additional activities. So um, as part of our We Thrive program, we did our kind of our first listening event through this survey with Glint to really understand kind of where are we, what's the state of engagement. We worked with our partner to identify where are those key areas. And then once we had our kind of direction, which was really around very clearly work-life balance and ways of working, we then wanted to make sure we were doing deeper listening beyond that. So that was where we went into things like we had focus groups with employees to really understand. Uh, we interviewed leaders who had high scores to understand what are the what are the actions, what are the behaviors that they're doing that are working really well so we can share that with others. And then a really key thing that we did was design thinking sessions, which was really all about taking that data and going even deeper to help us really chart the course for what we wanted to do. Because I think where surveys are great is it gives you a good sense at a moment in time of here's where our challenges are. And it gives you what I'll say are, you know, kind of here are the problems, but it doesn't necessarily help. It. You don't always get that sort of like root cause analysis until you sure. bring people together and have that conversation. So. Yeah, we're, we're definitely on our on a journey. We do use the um, writing comments. So we do use artificial intelligence with our survey vendor, but I think we have opportunities to go even beyond that as we think about how do we tie our engagement survey to what we're seeing on Glassdoor? How do we tie it to, you know, perhaps um, our exit surveys? Because we do those. We have onboarding surveys as well. So we're we're definitely starting to build up that muscle. And I see a real potential to, to kind of shift into even more of that. And Tom, as I look at the results, it seems like we have room for innovation here. I, you know, the number one uh, answer to the frequency was once or twice a year, uh, followed by quarterly. And then when I look at the, um, the methods, uh, reviewing and analyzing writing comments manually, I can see where that would be practical uh, for smaller companies, but the larger you get, that gets very impractical to do. So it feels like we still yeah. got a, a ways to go in listening strategies overall. Yeah, on that second question, there's close to a three to one ratio there uh, just amongst those that, that do the open answer questions and do something with it. 
almost three to one ratio. So definitely room for growth for the for the technologies. Any of the vendors that provide that, I'm sure happy to see the the room for growth for their businesses. Um, but I think if we were to have asked this question two or three years ago, it might have been a 10 to one ratio. So I'm sure we're right. growing fast in terms of using that technology. Well, Lauren and Mary Beth, I know you prepared some slides around your program called We Thrive, and I'd love for you to just uh, walk us through that. Uh, I know you've, you've prefaced it a little bit here, but uh, tell us a little bit about how you created the program and what it involves. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you, if you want to jump to the next slide, I, I think there's some some good things here. Um, so first of all, Mary Beth did a really good job of sharing what's so special about our, our culture. And what we knew was we had really important strengths and you know our, our heritage, our Japanese heritage, our strong portfolio. And we do have the ability to be agile in our regions where, where we're able to do that. And we also have people that truly care about the work. But we were also clear that we have challenges that were holding us back to really getting to where we want to go. So based on that first engagement survey that we conducted, we saw things like you're seeing on the slide on that from in that from column that were telling us our employees were really struggling to, you know, to do it all right. We have these challenges with the ways in which we work. And we also, so we looked at our engagement survey, we also saw that a large driver of burnout um, and, and lack of balance were actually leading to exits. So we were taking that very seriously because we want to make sure, you know, we're retaining our employees. So we knew we had the opportunity to address it. And really what we wanted to do here was shift the narrative to things that you're seeing on the left, things like I, we heard, I'm in back-to-back -back meetings all day, I can't get anything done. We wanted people to say, I feel like the meetings I join are focused, they're efficient. We wanted a shift where people were saying, I'm exhausted, there's so much governance and socialization to, I feel clear on my role and I, I have that clarity. We also wanted to shift from this sense of everything's a priority, everything's urgent to, I know where I need to focus to excel and people were really clear on their, their priorities. And then a big one that we hear because of our Japanese culture, right? And because, you know, there is a 13 hour time difference between ourselves and Japan. I don't have enough time to get my work done because I have a 7 a.m. with Japan and a 7 p.m. with Japan. Like, when can I do my job, right? So we wanted to, again, shift that to I'm empowered to own my day. And if you have a 7 a.m. and a 7 p.m., the company is empowering me to block my day to exercise, to spend time with my family and to focus on my well-being. So that's really the, the journey that we kind of sought out to, to solve for. So if you go to the next slide, I can share a little bit about our design thinking session. So I mentioned this, that we, in addition to our survey, which told us loud and clear, work-life balance was a challenge, we really wanted to pull back the, peel back the onion, if you will, and go deeper. Like, okay, people are saying it's too much and I'm burned out, but what's the root cause of that? Because until we understood that, we couldn't create the right solutions to truly solve the problem. So what we did, we used our survey as the spark. We had two sessions, three and a half hours of brainstorming, we got nine, over 90 rapidly brainstormed ideas and we got a lot of stories. We heard things like, you know, it's more than basic leadership. Our, our leaders need in the emotional intelligence to understand the why. Um, we also heard that this isn't necessarily a challenge for everybody, right? Like in some parts of the business, they were thriving where in others it was, it was too much. So how do we support those folks? And then a really key one that we have made really foundational in our We Thrive campaign is that saying no is not a negative, that it's okay, and even it's a good thing to say, I can't help you right now. I want to help meet you where you are. I want to get you what you need, but it's not feasible for me to drop everything on my plate to do it for you right this moment. So we've really been kind of hearing that and helping with our, our program that negotiation skill and really empowering people to do that. So you can go to the next one. This is great stuff, by the way, Lauren. Thank you. 
Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, and please ask questions. I'm I'm gonna I'll go through a few of these and then we can, you know, certainly talk. But the the key, one of the key things that we heard after we did our survey was you need to show action relatively quickly, right? So you can't take a year to show us that you did something because when I came into the organization, there was this feeling of, gosh, we've done surveys years ago. Nothing happened with it. Perhaps there was a, a, a distrust, if you will, of the survey. So we were really trying to find the balance of showing visible action. So really kind of, I'll call it the low hanging fruit, but also building a strategy for actually solving the problem. So some of the things that we did that I'll call sort of our, our low hanging fruit were um, things that you see on the slide. So we actually shortened Outlook to be from 60 and 30 minutes to 25 and 50 to give people a break. So we work with our IT to do that. Um, we really reinforced some of our Focus Fridays, which is an opportunity block time for colleagues to really get work done. We offered something new for our field employees, giving them a focus week because they didn't have that as part of Focus Friday. So we really wanted to ensure that we were supporting everyone. We had tools that we created with the business that we rolled out. We did some workshops in partnership with our l and department, and we removed core hours from our policy, which was very intentional because, as I mentioned, that seven to seven if we know we need to have a 7 a.m. and a 7 p.m., when can I run? When can I go? When can I exercise? When can I, you know, have a break? So we wanted to give people the empowerment to say, you can take a break in the middle of the day. You, you're not bound to your desk. So those things were good and they were visible, but they they don't fully solve the problem because what we found is it's great we implemented 25 and 50 but it doesn't help if nobody uses it. So while it was happening, people were people were scheduling them in 25 and 50 because it was set up that way, but not sticking to it. So from a behavioral perspective, we're scheduling a 25, but we're going over. We're still taking a full 30. And that really led to our realization that we needed to do more and to have it be about embedding and sustaining truly behavioral change. So you can go to the, the next slide. So this is our, this is really the, the kind of the, the gist. This is the full, really the package of what we're trying to deliver with We Thrive. So we implemented these actions, but at the end of the day, what we knew was we, we needed a focused roadmap with one action at a time to really shift the behavior because the reality is that changing the ways in which we work does take time. Like I mentioned, we implemented the 25 and 50, but I'm still conducting a meeting for 30 or 60. So the behavior didn't stick. We use the analogy here of, of a light, like a light switch and a dimmer switch. So you turn on a light and it's immediately bright. And I think our employees were hopeful that we could implement this toolkit or this magic solution and everything's going to be great, right? And what we've been explaining to our employees and what we've been really focused on is it's a dimmer switch. We're slowly raising the light and helping people to take change and make action so that employees feel that relief as it continues to build. So this is all about one action at a time. So we started with boundaries. We did a six month campaign on just that. And we really had it be leader led. So we had our CEO talk about his story. We had employees telling stories. We did um, recognition. We had gamification to really kind of make it fun. And then we did some learnings within that. So a full six months. And it didn't start out that way. We actually started and we said, we'll do it for a few weeks and it'll stick and we'll be good, right? Because we knew 21 days to form a habit. Not enough, not enough. It's so difficult to make these changes that we really shifted from really a two-year roadmap to a three-plus year roadmap, probably a four or five, if I'm being honest, year roadmap. And you'll notice as well, we added decisive actions into this around energy management as we continue to listen to employees and react to what they're telling us. So we built this roadmap based on what we heard from our employees in the survey, 
based on the leadership interviews that we did. So when we spoke with our leaders that were doing it well, these were the behaviors that they modeled. So we really included that to say, let's make sure that all of these behaviors are truly solving the problem and going to make a difference. And we even reordered things to kind of meet the business where they were. So as an example, we had meetings far down the line, but that kept coming up as a frustration point. So we said, okay, this is more important for our business right now. Let's switch it. Let's do that first. And then we'll get to some of these other things. So it's very much building blocks. We're building behaviors. We're giving tools and we're having our leaders say, I want you to do this. I'm empowering you to do this. And the storytelling has been phenomenal. And I, I think Lauren, just to jump in, that to, just to highlight some of the some of the other shifts that that you and the and, and the team made in this. Um, one, just to kind of underline what Lauren has said, she's working with a cross functional team, right? So this is although she's behind the scenes, so technically it's an HR initiative. Very intentionally, we pulled people from across the business, both commercial and R&D, to really drive these initiatives because we wanted it to be owned by employees. And then we also shifted early on, we would do a lot of the formal presentations because we're so used to doing that. We shifted to have leaders give those presentations. So it was more time for Lauren to it to invest with those leaders, get them prepped and ready to go. But we really wanted to position our leaders to be the face of this, not HR, because the goal at the end of the day is to make sure we're embedding behavior change, right? We don't want any of this to be, okay, check the box. We delivered a, you know, a program on effective meetings. We will not deem ourselves successful if at the end of this, and well, during it, but we can't look back and say, behavior has noticeably changed and it's stuck. It wasn't just for a few days. We've formally and kind of officially changed the way we operate and the way we do business. So, and another key piece of that was really shifting and getting employees comfortable with taking accountability for their day, right? So we called it owning your day very intentionally because what we found, and if you go back to one of Lauren's, you don't literally go back, but on one of her earlier slides, it talks about shifting from, you know, I'm in meetings all day, I have no time to work to I'm choosing to control my day, right? So I'm blocking that time. I know I've got a call at seven and at seven, which we try to encourage people not to do both ends, but sometimes it happens. So if I know that's happening, I've blocked a couple of hours at some point during my day to run that errand, uh, go out and exercise, pick up the kids from work, do something for a relative, whatever that is for that person. So we're also trying to make that shift where instead of, not that our employees had a victim mentality at all, but kind of shift from that space of this is all happening to me to I have control as an employee over what's happening because it, that sense of control also helps people to feel more. And I, and I liked your word. It's not so much balance. It's really much like it's how are we doing this all together in that kind of in an intertwined way. Sorry to interrupt Lauren. No, that's perfect. Well, I have a quick question for both of you. Um, how uh, receptive was senior leadership to this roadmap right from the start or how difficult was it to get their uh, acceptance of it? I'll, I'll jump in, Lauren, but and, and I tend to be overly optimistic. So Lauren, back me up or, or correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, interestingly, they were very receptive, particularly around the piece of we've got to get people being accountable for this on their own. And part of that, and I forget the direct quote, um, but one of our senior leaders said, look, our business isn't slowing. Fortunately, right? We're in a position where our pipeline is strong. We've got a lot to deliver to patients and we're passionate about it. So if we don't get employees in the space of owning this and being accountable for it, it will only get worse. So there was an acknowledgement of we need to help the organization with these challenges. So let's get at it, right? They saw the survey results, they were living it, they knew it, and they were really up for if we can only do one thing, right? We're not going to tackle everything that came out of the survey. What one thing has the biggest impact? And it is this program. And like Lauren mentioned, I think she's done a really good job at here's some immediate wins we've delivered. And now here's the longer term play. What would you add, Lauren? 
I, I think you summarized it perfectly. I think our our leaders have truly been the it, they're they are they really are we thrive and they're they are what make it successful. And as I even look at our engagement survey results, that as we've repeated these things, what they're calling out is I so appreciate that our CEO gave me the permission to do this. So the messaging coming from him has truly impacted them. It's not from us, right? And I think Mary Beth made such an important point on that shift that that really set the stage for, for us to kind of take off, right? That that shift from HR, that sense of HR led to leader led. There was a, I'll share this, there was another senior leader who um, as part of our program came on and presented to all our employees and he he was vulnerable and he shared a personal story. And he said, you know, he had a conversation with his son and he asked his son, have I been a good father to you? And he didn't, you know, he expected, yeah, you know, dad, you've been amazing. You, you paid for my this and you did that, right? And what the son said was, yeah, dad, but you work too much. And his point in sharing that and what he said to employees was, that was a learning for me. And I don't want that to be any of you. I don't want that when you have a conversation with your son or your partner or whoever it is, that that's what you hear. Make it your priority to, to live your life. Work is important, but it's not all it is. And that permissioning coming from them, that to me was the turning point of success when, when they hearing their stories and they have been truly supportive of this and have even taken some of what we've done and gone a step further, which is kind of exciting to see as well. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a great question. Lauren, it, Lauren, that story actually speaks to uh, a point and a question that Mara just raised in the chat, which was, some people um, feel very comfortable maybe negotiating. They have strong confidence negotiating those boundaries for themselves, but others um, maybe don't. So she's, she, I think she's asking, is there um, like how much emphasis was put on a psychological sort of safe safe space to to come through and, and, and push for that, advocate for themselves? Was any maybe coaching or mentoring uh, sessions involved or training uh, for folks that maybe don't come by that kind of skill naturally? That is a perfect question. Actually, so if you go to the next slide, that there's a good setup for that. Um, so as part of what we did, we were focused on four these four quadrants of elevating leadership. So what we kind of talked about that, our change coalition, I can talk more about that. But a key piece of what we did was this sort of two-way engagement, and I'll call it really two-way engagement, but also training. So that's sort of embedded in here, but one of the really, one of the, the key pieces for us was exactly what Mara's question is in the chat. We knew that we had leaders that were excellent at this. We could name who they were, and that's not a skill set for everybody. So we worked really closely with our director of learning and development. We did multiple manager forums. We did workshops to really teach some of those skills around, you know, how do you sit down with an employee and have those conversations? How do you really listen? And we actually have a lot more work to do around that piece. So when we get into our next decisive action on energy management, we're actually going to be doing a, we're partnering with a company called Thrive Global, who are going to be working with us. And we're starting everything with our most senior leaders, teaching them the skills on how to put on your oxygen mask first so you can support yourself, and then giving them the tools and the training to support their employees. And that was really, really important to us because we know the number one driver of engagement is the manager. I mean, the manager cannot be underestimated in any of this. So a key sort of tenant or um, lever that we're, we're really pulling on is that leadership visibility, but giving them the skills to do so. And the other thing I'll add is we know that this isn't a problem everywhere. So we're putting extra emphasis and partnering with our HRBPs for the groups where they have lower scores, right? Because some there's a few um, teams that had 100 work, 100 percent work life balance. They're doing it. They got it. What do we? How do we really give more targeted tools and support and coaching to the leaders that are struggling? So we're we're shifting to this 80 20 of, you know, 20 you know focusing on the 20 percent for 80 percent impact is a, is another action. And be anything you'd add. 
No, I, I think you're spot on. And I, I think the other piece we added was the first decisive action was all around setting and articulating boundaries. And there were sessions that all employees could go to that kind of helped walk them through what's important to you. How do you articulate that? And then we encouraged managers to have conversations with their teams um, in a very safe way where it, colleagues were sharing with each other, what is your boundary? Right. So you didn't have to didn't have to tell a hundred people, but they, you know, had a chance to talk to their small working teams. And what we saw there, um, to speaking to our own team, we we check in with each other, right? How are you doing on that boundary? What can I do to support that boundary? Um, and we would also hold each other accountable, like, hey, you said your boundary was this, like come on, don't, don't accept that meeting. We know you have to go to, you know, a baseball game. That's my own. Right. Um, so don't accept that meeting, go to the baseball game. We would be, when you give something voice, other people can help you in that way to keep that boundary. When you kind of keep it internally and no one knows, they don't know they're breaking the boundary. So we're trying to get people really talking about it. We had another, go ahead, go ahead Tom. <laughs> We're probably going to say the same thing, but I, I was uh, noting Beth's question here, um, which I think is a great one. Was it hard to gain the mind share among the leaders and supervisors uh, amidst a lot of competing business priorities? You know, it sounds like gaining that leadership buy-in at the get-go was critical. So, so that it would uh, cascade going forward. Was that the case? I I think what we had on our side was the survey result. Right. So by nature, we're a scientific organization and the fact that we were able to show them numbers. Right. And again, survey results aren't as quantitative as the clinical trial is, but it's as kind of close as we can get in this space. So by showing them data that said this is our our biggest area of opportunity. And we had, we had a couple, but this is among them. Right. You couldn't dispute it. Right. So they they saw the numbers. They from a corporate perspective, they saw their own numbers as leaders and they were hearing from employees, right? And we also had the benefit that all over the news because of the pandemic was this conversation and topic of, uh, of balance, right? And harmony. So it wasn't, it, it helped to take any kind of stigma away from it if everyone was already talking about it. And then we had the data behind it. So with that, I, I think it really helped us kind of break down those barriers and get people on board with, this is how we're gonna become successful. If we are able to empower colleagues to tackle this and own it, we can unlock really future success for the organization. So as a, as a company that's in, uh, you know, largely in two different countries, Japan and the US, what kind of cultural differences have you seen um, as you rolled this out? Lauren, do you want to speak to that? Because we've, sure. we've rolled it out really kind of, it, it started as a local, as a regional initiative in the U.S., right? right. And so, and we operate, we, have, we operate around the world, but I would say our primary locations are U.S., Japan, and Europe. Um, we also so have some some business in, in ASCO as well. So Lauren, I'll, you you have been kind of at the forefront of that global piece. So I'll let you speak to that. Yeah, no. So I think, so a couple of things. So first, this we started this in the US, but what has been really good and interesting is we got this data, right, from in the US. We started as a US survey and we heard work-life balance is a challenge. Then we rolled out a global survey because we didn't have that global data and we heard similar sentiment. We heard the number one comment on the global survey, which included Japan. So they saw that too. There was a large red bubble on meetings and frustration with meetings. So I think to Mary's best point, having that data on our side was really helpful. So they also were committed to solving the problem. The difference that I've noted, and it's, it's very, it's a cultural difference is in the U.S., we, we do this sort of change management in that we're trying to get everyone to adjust their behavior to, you know, it's not just a, a guideline or a rule on a piece of paper, because we know that, as I shared about the 25 and 50, just because you do that doesn't mean anybody changes. Japan has a different sort of culture in that they, they share something. There's a guideline that's shared. And the need for that change management isn't as strong because there's a 
it was asked of me, I was asked to do this, you know, above, and I'm going to do it. So there's sometimes a little bit of a, hey, you know, in the US and in Europe, we really need to do this kind of ongoing change campaign, which is, which they respect, and they want to support us in that, but perhaps is less relevant, or maybe less needed for our colleagues in Japan. So I think it's just more about having those conversations with our colleagues and really continuing to kind of raise that and help them understand that we love these guidelines because they put out some as well and we're a part of that but that for the U.S. and Europe we need to go a step further to really ensure that we actually see the change so I, I think that's the main thing that I've noticed. Yeah and I think that speaks to Tanya's question uh, that came in right as, as Kevin asked his um, you know, how, how responsive is the parent company to the different regional differences? And it sounds like in this case, the United States is one of the regional differences in the sense that uh, we, we, we need more change management <laughs> uh, as opposed to just following the orders of, of the higher level leaders. Yeah. I feel we're very lucky. I don't know how Mary Beth feels, but I feel, you know, our um, global head of HR, uh, Matsumoto-san, amazing leader, very receptive, very aware that this is, he understands that, you know, this is the Japanese culture, but I want to listen to you and really takes the feedback, wants to really create an HR and a, and a global organization that represents those uniquenesses. So my, my impression is very, very um, receptive to that. And I think that really just comes from the leadership. Mary Beth, what do you, what do you think? I would agree. And, and interestingly, I mentioned earlier, we're, we're on an evolution to becoming global. So 10 years with a company, when I first joined, we were technically global in that we had operations in multiple locations around the world, but each region operated very independently for, for years and years. And I would say that, you know, this project happened to kind of come along at the same time where we really emphasized the commitment to actually becoming global. So that was actually one of the nuances that we've had to work through, right? Because we're used to being able to take a regional approach and go, and we've had to navigate blending this into a global environment. Because if in the US we're committing to these effective meeting practices, it doesn't really help if a lot of our meetings are becoming global and no one else is. And I think Lauren has done a great job of, because she's on different global projects, we also recently rolled out global core behaviors. And as part of that, we're, we're leveraging our effective meeting decisive action and sharing that out globally. So we're looking at opportunities for really how do we connect the dots on all of these things so that it all seems connected um, for colleagues. So, and, and really just to echo her point, we are very fortunate in that well, yes, we are headquartered in Japan. Our colleagues in Japan are very collaborative in that they invite us into the conversation. Us and colleagues around the world are in the conversations and they're, they're, we're listening to each other's feedback to get at the right answer for us as a global organization. It's not just you know information getting pushed out to, to the region. So really, really grateful for that approach. And I, I think I saw a comment about um, saying no to meetings. And that actually is a part of the effective meetings is getting much better at, you know, if both Lauren and I are invited to the same meeting, do we really both need to be there? Um, can, can I go and represent the team? Can she go and represent the team? And then how do we share back? So that is something that we're, that we're, we're looking towards. Yeah, it's one of those superficially paradoxical aspects of effective meetings is having less meetings and saying no to meetings. Um, oh, yeah. One thing I, I wanted to just commend you on, uh, your, both of you and your entire team, I mean, this, is, this call has flown by, we're almost uh, coming up on time, um, but uh, this is one of those rare circumstances I've seen where you all and the senior leadership team have, have seen something that was important versus urgent and went ahead with the important thing to do, uh, as opposed to uh, you know the day-to-day the -day urgencies that always distract us from what's truly long-term important. That doesn't happen nearly enough in business. Um, that's why we have the cliche of the urgent versus the important, but, but you're doing it here. And, it, and for leadership to sign on to that um, and say, I, I, it probably helped that your business is growing. Uh, I wouldn't wanna say that's a necessary condition for doing that, but being in a good financial position and growing uh, helps you to, to maybe look at things that are long-term important and implement them. Um, but nonetheless, to have the courage to do that is, has been wonderful. 
No, th thank you for, for saying that, Tom. And, and it's interesting because as you were speaking, I was flashing back to a call we were having. Ironically, I was actually in the car, which is probably why I remember it. Talk about being flexible, right? Where we were debating our timeline and it was, you know, well, do we wait to start? Do we wait to start? And we all looked at each other, well, virtually anyway, and said, if we wait for the right time, it will never come because there's never going to be the space to do it. But we heard what our leaders said in that this is something we have to solve because we're going to be, you know, there's going to be only more work coming everyone's way. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that reflection because it was very intentional and difficult to do in that way. And we haven't used the term burnout, I don't think, in this conversation, but you're well ahead of that. You know, that's all we hear about today um, is the, you know, the well-being of the workforce and the, you know, mental and emotional uh, side of that in particular. And it just seems to me like you've done a great job at, at tackling, you know, some, some of those with these changes. But I'm curious, is there, are there other things you're doing just on the well-being side of, of things for the employees? Yeah, I'll give you um, a few examples of that. And I alluded it alluded to it in the introduction, right? Just our shift from, you know, instead of being a total rewards function, a total well-being function. And interestingly, we were starting to look at that probably, if I had to guess, like 2018, 2019, it was something that as a team we were exploring and really trying to kind of get ready to build that path. We had the good fortune of a new chief people officer coming in um, in the summer of 2019. We did a restructuring of HR at the time. Um, and as part of that, we branded ourselves as a total well-being team. We added Lauren's role in so that we could focus specifically on employee engagement and the employee experience because we saw the value of this isn't just about your classic comp and benefits. This really is about looking at people holistically and what kind of programs can we put in place to support all of our colleagues who have different needs so that they can be themselves and bring their best selves in service to patients, right? Um, so if I were to highlight some of the things we've done along the way, and it's a journey for us, right? Because we are evolving as an HR organization. So I always say we've got this wish list that we're keeping and every once in a while we can kind of make progress on some of them, but we're, we're really looking forward to really kind of further developing our long-term strategy and really actioning it. Um, but in addition to things we've already shared, um, we've at, during the pandemic, we introduced weekly employee assistance program live sessions on relevant topics. We've continued it. We've reduced it to monthly, um, but and, and changing the topics, but really based on on what folks are interested in. We gave managers a guide and kind of trained them on how to have check-in conversations with people. So not your typical one-on-ones focused on business, but how do you check in with your people as like human beings? Um, employee, one, one employee reached out with an idea on doing a fitness challenge. We launched that during the pandemic and we found that it gave people a way to connect virtually and form teams. So we've kept that and our benefits colleagues are, are um, evolving it. We're really excited. It's going to kind of be new and different um, this winter. I think we mentioned that we have summer hours. We introduced the Focus Fridays. Lauren mentioned that, our survey. Um, probably the most um, overt kind of policy change we made. Um, for 2022, we introduced 100% coverage for in-network mental health care. Um, so, so that was something that was really important to us to kind of match with our philosophy, kind of put our programs in place that, that did the same. And then I would say anything else, we, Lauren has kind of covered in the presentation. Well, uh, thank you, Kevin. You're on mute, uh, but uh, I'll uh, I'll wrap yeah, things. Thanks, here. Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom. We're we're at the end of the hour. This has been a a packed uh, a packed hour. So so interesting to hear all the details of of the We Thrive program and all the other things that I think the word intentionality came shining through in, in everything you're doing. Um, you're getting lots and lots of kudos in the chat. Uh, some folks had to leave a couple minutes early, probably for their next meeting. Uh, but uh, it's been wonderful. Kevin, uh, what do you want to say to wrap? I just want to say thanks to Lauren and Mary Beth. This was fascinating. And uh, I'd love to make sure we do a case study on some of this and if, if it's not already in the works. Um, but thanks for sharing with our audience. This was great. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thanks, everybody, thanks everybody for joining.
Yeah, thanks everyone for participating. Look forward to seeing you on a future Thursday call. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.